So Edge uh, is actually one of the oldest charter schools in Arizona and um, the oldest in Pima County. Uh, it started as actually a district funded joint effort between TUSD, Sunnyside, and I think Flowing Wells. And then when charter law came into existence in 1995, it became a charter school. The districts kind of thought the best way to secure permanent funding at the time it had been grant funded. So permanent funding could be received through creating it as a charter. So it was 10 years as this grant funded organization and then now the last 22 um, as a charter school. Um, and it, it's real, it's focused from the beginning as this kind of side effort of those districts and then on its own as a charter has been working with at-risk youth. Uh, who generally are underserved in the population, always a high school. So we serve grades 9 through 12, ages 14 to 21. Uh, and, you know, and it runs the whole range of really having 14-year-olds and really having 21-year-olds who are very functioning adults uh, all in the same school. Uh, it's intentionally small, so both campuses. We've had campuses all over Tucson, really. Uh, we've had them in Saurita. Uh, the current one here at Hemel Park right by U of A. We have one at Northwest, which is at Oracle and Ina. Uh, there's been one on the Pasco Yaki Reservation, Child and Family Resources, Teen Parent Program. So it's kind of as it was a grant school, it was like where, where was extra effort needed in the community? And that's where a school was. As it became a charter, then it kind of became these focused campuses. And um, the smallness is because many of our students uh, have faced some sort of challenge, a social, emotional challenge, academic challenge, and they really need much more structured support in a smaller environment. So our classrooms only have 22 students. Um, so that's our ratio of 22 to one compared to some classrooms that have to get really big at other schools. And that helps them get the focus and attention they need. The other piece is that we're self-paced so academically, they come in where they're at, and we start them on their track of towards graduation, but it's not you complete Algebra 1 with everyone else in this semester. It's you're able to complete it quickly or you need a little extra time, all that sort of thing. Um, uh, our campuses are very different from each other, the Northwest one and the Hemel Park one, socioeconomically. We have a much um, lower income population here at the Hemel Park campus and at the Northwest campus, they are higher socioeconomic. Uh, but that doesn't change the need of a student and a youth in their health. And that's, um, that's been the big change here at a charter school. We don't have the capacity for health resources in the same way that you might just experience and see at a district school. I and mean, that's pretty common across all charter schools. When charter schools were sort of conceived, right, there's kind of two different levels, and, and I think this is true at districts, too. Um, but many charter schools at the elementary level, you'll absolutely see a nurse's office because the, the medical and frequency needs of nurse care of your elementary age students is still really high. And many charter schools are K-8 at the elementary grade level and the middle school, so you're often going to have a nurse's office there. At the high school level, though, there's not really funding uh, the same way there is for district schools for facilities for charter schools. So a district can issue a bond and build a building and they're going to have, you know, they're going to have fields and they're going to have auditoriums and gyms and they're going to have administrative offices with health offices and, and all that sort of thing planned. With limited funding on a charter school, they tend to think, okay, what are the necessary functions? And one of those that doesn't come up is the health office. It's not a requirement by law to have a nurse at, on your staff at the high school level. I'm not sure if it is at the elementary level and that might be what's part driving it, but at the high school level it's not. So if there's no need for a nurse, there's no need for a nurse's space, right? And so you end up with what we have, which is several administrative offices and at the other campus as well, some administrative office spaces. And if a student's feeling ill, they come into your space. You see them. They might not self-disclose their ill. A teacher might be like, you're really sick. We need you to go to the office, right? Because they know there's not a nurse here to take care of them, so they don't say, I need to go to the nurse, right? So they, the teacher might suggest, hey, can you go to the office? We're, we would just want to check on you. So then we're doing a wellness check of, you know, what's what's feeling wrong, how long have you been feeling this way? And, and it's kind of all of us in this space that are all responsible for you know, just starting that conversation with them. Do you think you need to go home? How do you normally get home? Many of them ride the bus. 
um, or they walk because they live close by, so, you know, kind of coordinating with them. Um, if they're over 18, they can sign themselves out. So that's different than an elementary school, right? They might be feeling awful and just come up and sign themselves out. And you're like, how are you going to get home? How, like, how are you being cared for? Uh, in the case of, you know, like in an asthmatic situation or something like that, it's all right, let's try and have you in a calmer, quieter space. So at least come into one of the side offices. But a lot of times that first triage care is right there in the lobby. As long as it's quiet, if there's for some reason congestion and lots of people, then then we'll bring them back into an office and figure out, okay, what's going on? How can we help you? And so, you know, we have minimal resources and supplies of things we can give them, like some antacids and some uh, ibuprofen. And there are a handful of students, right, who have a medical prescription that we keep on file locked up, as you would see in a health office. Um, but th that's actually a pretty, pretty small group or self-disclosed pretty small group. That's part of what we deal with at a high school level is they might be carrying the medication in their backpack that you wouldn't experience at elementary level. But so a day in the life might be you walk into the office and s the first time we needed the inhalers was I walk into the office and I have asthma personally. So I see a student who's clearly in breathing in distress. And I, I, why don't you come back here? Let's, let's talk. How are you feeling? Can you breathe? Do you have your inhaler with you? Um, how bad does this feel for you? Didn't, didn't have their inhaler. Uh, and so, you know, get the binder and get started on the protocol of evaluating the student. But yeah, it, my office is a finance office and an HR office, but it's as, as soon as it needs to be a student's office, it's a student's office. So at a, at a charter school in particular, when you don't have health or something specific, like even our food service program, we cross train a lot because if someone's absent for a day, we, you can't not have the service. Like a student's gonna come in with asthma or a student's gonna come in for breakfast service and someone has to be there to feed them or provide them care. So cross training is really important in any of our disciplines, but um, there are, you know, at least three or four people who are always in this office working on things, so it makes sense that any one of us can respond to the student's need. And similarly, the other campus has about 70 students, so they're even a little bit smaller than here. Uh, but they have about three or four staff members cross-trained on it. It was an easy training platform, too, so it makes sense to make sure that people are well aware because a lot of times the students don't take advantage or, or know that they have the program available to them. You, we have to be self like diagnosing with them, like, hey, what's going on today? They, they might have a cold, right? That's turned bronchial and creating breathing and wheezing. They might not have ever experienced asthma themselves and know that that's what they're experiencing. Uh, so we have about 70% free and reduced. So that's below or at or below the poverty level at this campus. So of 170 students, 70% receive free and reduced lunch service. The other campus has about 40%, so even though they're socioeconomically different, they're still a high need at the other campus. We have about 20% of our students who are homeless, living in group homes, couch surfing, shelters, any sort of combination thereof. Um, about 20% of our students are students with disabilities, receiving special education services, and many of them are behind in credits when they get to our school, or they've just been at a lot of schools. They might not yet be behind, but we had one student a year ago that had, they were on their 13th high school. It's not uncommon that they're on their third or fourth. Um, you know, and sometimes it's their own poor choices or sometimes they've just gotten lost in a subject and pr been promoted and they're so far behind that they, they can't. We had a student come in who was on paper a junior, but she disclosed to us she couldn't really read. And that was someone that, you know, we had enrolled, but ultimately we had to suggest that she go to a more intensive reading program focus that I think was being offered through Pima County because her level of need was so severe, like, that she needed extra services before she could really approach a high school education. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're wonderful and kind people and students and like you saw in the artwork in the hallways, they're inventive and they're teenagers by all means are they teenagers, right? So it's very different from an elementary level to a teenage level. They've got all the emotion and energy and anxiety that they're dealing with and processing. 
that is really about learning to become an adult and making good choices and making bad choices and seeing them learn to interact with peers and handle conflict and find success, figure out what it means to set a goal. All those things are happening at the same time that you're just trying to teach them how to grow and learn and live, but in math and English and history and science. And um, we have, you know, a variety of programs. We try to offer them just like a, a, a traditional school district of some sports, but we're limited because we don't have sport facilities here. So we have a basketball team. We've had a running club. Um, so things that we can do on smaller scale. We're next to the park, which is a great benefit. Um, but then our students are part of like charter leagues for sports. And, um, you know, some of our extracurriculars of like arts are really important because many of them struggle in their English and their history and their science, their core subjects, and they need that that out of their mind space using their hands um, to mm -hmm. kind of feel connected to their education. And so this is different. So a lot of charter schools, at an elementary again, like they tend to set them up thinking, okay, they're gonna come and they're gonna need lunch. So they'll build a cafeteria with an elementary charter school. Many charter high schools don't have cafeterias. Ours does not either. Um, and so, and this is much more common at the charter school than at the district schools, but we cater our lunch service. So an outside vendor prepares the lunches and brings it in and we have a space where we can serve lunch. Um, so we don't have a kitchen and all those things to prep food here. They bring it and we serve it. Um, and, and often they serve it for us and we're just part of like the record keeping and um, of the side of the food. And this is the first year that we've even had a food service program. So even though 70% of our students have qualified and that's been the same over the really the life of the school, um, this was the first year that we've been, even been able to offer a food service program because we know the need is so high with our students that many of them are, they were coming to school and falling asleep. They were buying junk out of vending machines um, or just eating, bringing, I, I kid you not, I saw a kid bring at 7.30 in the morning last year a bag of Doritos, like a full-size bag of Doritos. That was his breakfast and his snack that he was going to eat throughout the morning for his fuel his mind um, and so it was really important um, that we have a program that can feed them healthy and nutritious food because they aren't eating it and sometimes it's by no malintent at all of the families right um, sometimes the families don't have the, the you know the food themselves and that's horrible and I'm glad we're offering it to them but sometimes teenagers don't wake up until 8 30 even though they're here and they're not ready to eat and so they need to get into their space and finish waking up. And then we offer them breakfast later after they've actually been here for an hour because then they're awake and ready. Uh, so it's very, very interesting when you learn kind of how, how their day works. <laughs> yeah, there are some serious basic necessities, right, that, that we do without um, and then we build in where we can. So obviously not having a health office or really health facilities in any way is a huge huge loss. I mean, we, we put, um, for the food service program, we didn't really have a space at all for that. And there's requirements from the health department about what you need for that. So to meet the basic necessities of student, a lot of our students need mental and emo emotional support. Um, they've, many of them have se severe trauma emotionally in their lives. Um, it just, it's a very common at both campuses and so we actually have um, we were just in a conference the other day about this with some other district schools we have two licensed mental social workers so a lot of a lot of high schools have counselors and the counselors are focused on post-secondary transition like getting to college and making career path choices we have a counselor for that at both campuses but we also have two like mental health trained experts about you know counseling services and then connecting students with counseling services so often that gets not talked about in a high school setting but that's really kind of a basic necessity of our students because they come here with a lot going on and you're asking them to focus on geometry or English essays and they're trying to process that they got kicked out of their house last night or that a family member is now in jail you know, something severe has happened and they need someone to process that with. So, so that's a basic necessity of many of our students.
food because they, they were literally coming here and falling asleep because they were so hungry and undernourished um, and their health. And a lot of them don't have access to health care um, or they're in a situation where they're afraid to go to a doctor because of their, their status. And so, you know, Sometimes we are the first front line for those sorts of social cares and service cares for them. And we don't have a lot of resources ourselves for them. Uh, so we do what we can. So when this program, when the Stock and Taylor program showed up, I'm like, but we have to have this. Um, and I think there's similarly like an EpiPen sort of ish program. And to me personally, the reason I grabbed onto it immediately was because I'm asthmatic and have been since I was 16. And when I was a teenager in high school, I forgot my inhaler all the time. And I had really bad asthma and I ran cross country, which was probably not the smartest combination, but it was the case. And, and we didn't have anything like that. So if I forgot my inhaler, I would panic, right? And then I was worried that I was gonna panic and cause myself to have a reaction. So both those things happen and um, it can send you to the hospital, right? And so, and my son happens to have a peanut allergy. So I'm equally adamant about having EpiPen control because when, when they come to school, especially as high school students, they fill out their enrollment paperwork and one of the th sheets is allergies or no medications and things like that. And that's stock across all the districts. When you're writing all that out for your eight-year-old you're writing it all out very carefully but many of our students are coming in and filling out their information mostly on their own um, the parents have to come in to sign things if they're under 18 but if they're over 18 they can sign everything themselves and so they don't necessarily fill all that out so we we can have students who we don't know and I'll have a conversation with them and you know maybe we're getting ready for a field trip uh, and I'm reviewing just to see what everyone's needs are and then someone, oh, I am allergic to bees. Well, what'll happen? I'll, I'll go into shock. I'll, I'll need one of those pens. Do you have one? I don't tend to bring it. Or uh, I, was in, I was in Flagstaff with some students uh, visiting NAU two years ago, and they did a photo scavenger hunt. And now, mind you, now we're at 7,000 feet. Air's thin. I've got my inhaler because I know that it's a risk area. Um, especially and so I've always got mine with me and they're running around doing their photo scavenger hunt two girls come back and they're like I can't breathe and I'm like do you have asthma yeah do you have your inhaler with you we're four and a half hours from Tucson neither of them had their inhalers with them and they weren't bad reactions so they were able to breathe through it um, but at that time there wasn't the law that allowed us to have a stock inhaler with us uh, and these students are teenagers and they forget to pack stuff. That's critical. Luckily, right, we had the capacity of NAU's resources, so then it's like, let's go over to the admissions office and see what they can help us with. So they had support services in their health office, so then it was, we could let them take over from a healthcare perspective. But at that point, it's like, okay, well, we wouldn't, had I not known about asthma myself, we would not have had staff trained to know what to do with that student, right? You're in a field trip setting, you're away from anything. Um, and now I feel like just efficacy of staff is up. Like if any of the teaching staff see a student in breathing distress, like they know to send them to the office and that we have inhalers. Um, and that's something we just didn't have. And there was no point in having a conversation with teachers about that before because we didn't have anything to give the student. Um, I maybe a year ago we called 911 um, when a student came to the office didn't have in their inhaler and I was like you're you're having a, a really bad asthma case of asthma right now and do you have your inhaler with you no do you have a way to get to it no okay we're gonna call 911 because I don't know how far yours is gonna go and I'm not gonna risk it and now today what's it like now today I mean we have the stock inhalers and even just like three weeks ago, we had a field activity out in the park. S student was running, doing stuff with um, the police academy actually did a fundraiser with the students. And they were here having like a fun like competition, like obstacle course thing. Um, but one of the students ended up with an asthma attack during that experience. And so then we're all over there. So we come over here, get the, get the kit, 
get the inhaler, get the, I forget what they call the little breathing chambers, the collapsible ones, and like get, get going to help her because she'd forgotten her inhaler. So, but everyone is more aware now and we have a solution that we can immediately deploy. Um, and I couldn't believe when we started the program, like back there in like August, within like a week or less, I'd finished the training. Ashley had brought the materials to our school. I'm like, okay, look at all this great binder and all this. And what are these funky cardboard chambers? Okay. And it was like five days and there was a student in my office needing to use them. I'm like, wow, I'm really glad we have this. And I was like, that was a fluke. Five days later, there's another one. I'm contacting Ashley. I'm like, I'm worried about running out of these chambers because I've got five and I've already got two that I've used. So I've only got three left and I'm like 10 days in. Um, and so I was talking to her about, can we get more? Is there, do we need to order them ourselves? You know, what's the cost, etc. Where can I order them from? I'm um, lucky we were able to get more, but um, yeah, it, it's just knowing that it's there and being able to support the students because asthma attacks are scary. Um, students who don't know they have asthma have asthma um, because they they've never been diagnosed. They just they're or they they have an illness and now they're breathing poorly, um, and you know they just don't know what they're experiencing, but. As soon as I hear whistling and wheezing, I'm just, I can feel it in my own like congestion in my throat from my experience and I'm like, okay, let's, let's talk how long has this been going on? Have you ever had an asthma attack and those sorts of things. Send them home, like it was, you know, send them home, which is a real loss for the student because if it's a low level attack, right, a quick two, three, you know, use of dosages of the inhaler and 10, 15 minutes of rest and they're ready to go again. Um, and instead, you know, you had to lose an entire day with a student possibly and, and worse, risk their health because you don't know, is that getting worse? If you send them home on a bus, what's going to happen? If they're walking home, what's going to happen, right? You, none of those things you want to happen. Um, and we didn't have anything. And so this is huge. And, and you know, I know it took probably many steps to get through legislatively and to find funding for. Um, but especially as you just hear allergies and asthma and all those things keep growing in our students and our youth in Pima County and across the nation really, like that it becomes like having a thermometer, right? It, it's, a, it's just as critical a piece to have on hand as any other tool. It's, it's an ibuprofen, it's, an, it's at that level of need. Well, this is critically important. And I mean, in the cu current context we're in, in like Red for Ed and support for education and funding, and both wearing a finance hat and knowing that these resources aren't in all schools, the reason they're not in all schools is because we have had to make choices, right, of what we can put in the classroom and support in textbooks and supporting teachers and advocating for salaries. And so some of these other services we've gotten away from having, and the funding for them the fact that they're not requiring a school to go find the funding for it to have that service has been critical and and we're unbelievably grateful. So the sponsors who, put, who helped put this in classrooms, in schools, have made a huge difference to you know the seven, eight students that I saw in those first two months whose families I didn't have to call and say, I have to send your kid home, they're having a really bad asthma attack. We could say, hey, your student came to us and they didn't have an inhaler. We had our school inhaler and we were able to care for them and they're doing fine and they're back in the classroom but we wanted to let you know that you know they had this happen today. They forgot their inhaler. Please remind them to bring it but we've got resources here for them. Um, that call as a parent myself, that feels good to know that that can happen in your school.